Greetings to my YouTube followers. This is John Demilkis, half man, half cichlid. Today I'm going to revisit a very popular video from years back, and that's uh, the biology of the sump. I'm going to focus on changes, tweaks, optimizations, whatever you want to call it, over the last nine years with my 340 gallon aquarium and the sump over the last five years uh, with my 500 gallon uh, aquarium. The changes and improvements have been uh, substantial and I wanted to share those with you. Uh, the focus today is not going to be on the mechanics and the physics and uh, the DIY aspects of setting up a SEM some, but to focus on the biology, specifically the uh, nitrification and denitrification that occurs uh, within my aquarium system. And a focus in particular on my 500 gallon aquarium, which has a 110 gallon uh, sump. Uh, I'll focus on the stability that a sump system offers. One of the things I've learned over my 60 plus years in fish keeping is keep the system stable. Make only minor changes. Your, fishes, your fish are very sensitive to a lot of the changes that we make in filtration, cleaning filters, bottom vacuuming, and so on. I'm also going to focus on the capacity of my sumps, the large capacity for uh, nitrification, the large capacity for uh, detritus uh, collection and digestion, uh, particularly since uh, most of my aquariums, all my aquariums for that matter, uh, don't have essentially very, if little, if any, substrate. So I have the, uh, the detritus essentially removed and housed and broken down, digested within the sumps. Uh, I'll also focus on uh, well, not only the stability, but you know the capacity. How much you I mean you have to increase the capacity of the sump if. Uh, you don't have your gravel, for example, your substrate holding a lot of uh, the detritus. So I hope you'll find this uh, video very helpful. And just a, a few closing thoughts on sumps. They're not for everybody. I, I wouldn't recommend them for anyone who has an aquarium less than 150 gallons, unless you're just really into sumps. Uh, uh, so they're not for everyone. They, they're typically for large aquariums. They're also typically for an aquarium aquarist that likes to tinker. There are a lot of things you can do to uh, spiff up, to uh, improve uh, the performance, the biological aspects, the throughput of, of a sump. So being able and liking to tinker, uh, you know, these aren't out-of-the-box solutions in most cases to your, to your uh, some problems. And lastly, particularly if you're uh, into science, I'm a bio bi biologist by education and uh, profession. Uh, if you're into biology, there's a lot of things you can do within the stump uh, system. Uh, everything from growing out fry in your fruit refugium to starting a what I call a plant farm where we have emergent plants growing within the sump to aug augment uh, my collection of submerged aquarium plants, particularly the slow growers like Anubias. So hope you enjoy, hope uh, there's something here that you learn. Hopefully there's something that you can adapt to your uh, equipment.
query and keeping because in the end the, uh, the magic words for a successful aquarium in my opinion are, uh, are stability and uh, achieving pristine water. Thank you. We're going to start out with a uh, quick look at my, <clears throat> excuse me, 340 gallon uh, grow out tank, which is uh, primarily cichlids and uh, Australian rainbows, and I also have some Denison barbs. Uh, this is the first tank I set up nine years ago, and it's supported by a 65 gallon uh, sump. Uh, the water flows from left to right. You can see there's a refugium. And then, of course, uh, you can see uh, uh, to the right is the uh, return chamber where I have a, a couple uh, uh, pumps. So, again, it's been up and running for nine years. One of the reasons I wanted to go with a sump on my 500 gallon, which you'll see in a minute, is because uh, I wanted to have a lot of, uh, of uh, media and surface area to hold uh, detritus and uh, beneficial bacteria. The alternative, of course, is, uh, I don't know, 10 or so eHimes or FX6s. So we're transitioning now to my 500-gallon acrylic bowfront aquarium. And as you can see, uh, we have some very large Central and South American cichlids, as, as well as some very large uh, red-tailed giant garamis. These guys, the garamis can can reach uh, nearly uh, 20 inches in size. So they produce a lot of waste. They produce a lot of ammonia, and of course, uh, they produce a lot of uh, nitrates. On the uh, end of the uh, nitrification, denitrification process, of course, is uh, uh, denitrification, which uh, uh, I have a uh, aquaponic grow bed that consumes the uh, nitrates that uh, uh, are from the fish. Now the quick overview of the 110 gallon uh, uh, acrylic sump. Uh, the water flows from uh, right to left you can see uh, the return uh, at the left side and the input at the right side. We will uh, go through each of these areas in more detail, but you know, basically uh, on the, on, at the front end, you have a, an aeration chamber followed by a pre-filter, followed by a refugium, and then there's the backbone of the... Uh, the sump, which is a, a layer of various porosities of uh, uh, foam. I've removed the top of the, uh, the uh, sump for a closer inspection, and then we are uh, focusing right now on the front end, which is uh, the water uh, inlets uh, from the aquarium. And uh, I call this the aeration chamber. I think many of us forget the importance of, of oxygen and the rate at which uh, the nitrification uh, cycle occurs. So what, I, what I'm doing here is super uh, saturating water with oxygen before it hits the uh, media and the bacteria. So if the, the water moving from right to left at uh, about 4,500 gallons uh, per, per hour, and it's going out through a 20 ppi foam block, which is a pre-filter I have to, to uh, rinse every couple of uh, three weeks. I have a weight in there for my old uh, weight belt that keeps the, the foam uh, in place. And uh, in this chamber, too, the water falls through to uh, a, a couple large socks, and we'll talk about those uh, next. Now I've lifted up the 20 ppi uh, foam, and you can see I have uh, 
two large socks, and they're filled with uh, one of my favorite media, which is the pot scrubbies. They have tremendous surface area. They grow a lot of biofilm, so they're an excellent choice at the front end uh, of the uh, the uh, sump. 600 micron socks, by the way, do not plug. Now we're continuing to move uh, downstream. Uh, the next stage is the uh, refugium, and uh, we have the water from the aquaponic grow bed where it's going through denitrification, entering the sum at about 500 gallons uh, per hour. Uh, on the uh, top of the sump uh, foam, I started what I call my Anubias farm. This has just been set up a couple weeks. I've discovered that Anubias grows about five times as fast emergent as uh, submerged. So this is where I'm going. Skipping over the foam for a section, we'll go to the uh, end chamber where we have the return to the main tank and also the return from the UV sterilizer. Now we're doing a frontal view of the sump rather than an overhead view. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, refugium, and as you can see in the bottom here, these are bags of crushed coral to add calcium to my aquarium uh, so it doesn't get depleted from all the plant growth. I also have a Eheim pump in here that, where I send about 500 gallons per hour uh, through my UV uh, sterilizer. There's a quick view there again of my emerging, my emergent Anubias uh, farm. Next, just a quick shot of the uh, UV sterilizer. You can see the input uh, water's pumped from the Eheim pump inside the refugium again. And it goes down through this uh, long tube to the uh, return to the main tank. Uh, I use this, of course, mainly for uh, uh, parasites and other things that uh, might uh, affect uh, the uh, expensive aquarium fish. Now we're going to talk about what is really the guts of the sump, and that is uh, the foam. And I have it stacked and it's from uh, Swiss Tropicals, Perret Foam. And I have it um, going from starting with a 10 all the way through a 45 PPI for much finer uh, elimination of uh, crud and detritus. Now we're going to zoom in on the uh, multi-layered approach with sequential porosities of the Perret Foam. Uh, the water again is flowing from uh, right to left at about 4,500 gallons uh, per minute. And uh, there's the tremendous uh, surface area, of course, with uh, foam. It's, it's at or near the top of the list in terms of surface area and ability to digest uh, uh, ammonia and nitrites. Uh, you can also see the accumulation of uh, uh, processed detritus and uh, well, again a lot of lot of capacity in here. It's important to look uh, real closely for a second at the uh, surface of the water. Uh, as the water proceeds through the different layers of porette foam it runs into some level of resistance. That's why the water level will drop uh, with each successive layer. Now, this is a good way to observe uh, when maintenance is required for the Perret uh, foam blocks. And typically, uh, they last at least uh, three months, and I can clean them on a rotational basis. Hope this uh, helps, uh, and uh, look forward to your comments.